Turn, if you would, in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to be reading verses 23 through 34. I'm a firm believer in expositional preaching, going through a book of the Bible verse by verse, but uh, there are certain topics that need to be dealt with, and seeing as we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper tonight, uh, the topic of the Lord's Supper is certainly worthy of a single sermon, and we'll be looking at that topic uh, through these verses. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 reads, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do ye in remembrance of me. After the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink of the cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Let's pray. Our custom is to pray silently for just a moment as you prepare your hearts to receive the preaching of the word, asking for the help of the Holy Spirit to understand the words of God. Father, as we come now to the portion of our worship service where we involve ourselves in what the Word of God calls the foolishness of preaching, we ask that you'll make it not foolish to us, but use the preaching of the Word of God to exalt yourself, to bless your people, to convict sinners, and that through it all, you may receive all the glory as we preach your Word. Help me, I pray, in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. I remember hearing of a young pastor up north who was called to, to be the senior pastor of his first church. And things were going well after several months, but he noticed that every time they observed the Lord's Supper, some of the members were noticeably upset with him. Uh, being wise for his young age, he didn't want to let this problem fester. And so he went to an older member who he knew would be honest with him and asked him if he knew what the problem might be. And the man went on to tell him that he and several other of the older members were quite upset because he was not administering the Lord's Supper in the right way. The problem was that the former pastor, who had been there for decades, he always went to the side of the room and he waved his hands in a ceremonial way before administrating the Lord's Supper, and you're not doing that. So the new pastor, who wasn't doing that, uh, uh, be believed that he was administering the Lord's Supper in a proper way. And so this mystery to this new pastor uh, forced him to contact the old pastor to find out what he had done and why he had done it. And so the old pastor told him that as he got older, his hands were very cold in this northern building, and so he didn't want to drop the plates or anything like that. And so he always went to the radiator at the side of the building and, and warmed his hands up before administrating the Lord's Supper. And because of that, uh, he hadn't told anyone what, that what he was doing. The congregation thought that was part of the ceremony. There was some kind of 
spiritual significance to this hand waving before they administer the Lord's Supper. And so it is often in churches when things are done over and over again without explaining what and why things are being done, people assign meanings to these activities and it often leads to problems. So with that being the case, and with our celebration of the Lord's Supper tonight, I wanted to go over some very familiar territory regarding this great ordinance. You're probably not going to learn anything new, but you will be reminded of what we're doing and why we're doing it so there can't be any confusion. I know that most of you are very familiar with the things involved in this celebration, but it never hurts to occasionally do a sermon on the topic of the Lord's Supper and also on baptism to keep our minds sharp regarding the only two ordinances that the Lord has established in his churches. There used to be a store in the Merritt Island shopping mall called Things Remembered. Uh, you could buy certain objects and then have them engraved as a memento of some person or occasion or event. Uh, my son Kevin, in his business, does very much the same thing as he engraves plaques and trophies and urns and many other items to commemorate special days, special people, special honors. Now, if you receive such a personal gift or an award, it oftentimes becomes a treasured keepsake as you remember this special award or this special event or this special person who gave it to you. Memories are precious as they keep us uh, connected with people and places and events that have impacted our lives. People like to remember happy times and important events. And at the same time, there are things in our lives that we would like to forget. But even the troubling things in our past can give us valuable lessons that can be learned only through trials and tribulations, which the Lord told us we would have in this world in John 16, 33. At the Last Supper, Jesus gathered his all but one faithful disciples. He shared a meal with them and then led them in the ancient observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Feast of the Passover. Jesus, being the great teacher that he was, used this opportunity to plant an important memory in the disciples whom he had gathered together on that special night. Jesus shared this meal for their benefit and for ours today. He raised the bread and the cup in thanksgiving, and then he added new significance to this ancient ritual. Luke chapter 22 tells us that Jesus told his disciples to observe the Passover in remembrance of me. Jesus took old symbols and filled it with brand new meaning. The meaning of Jesus' words and actions on that evening is rooted in his command to remember. And as disciples today, we observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Christ. Some people refer to this ordinance as the Memorial Supper to highlight Christ's uh, uh, work on the cross while calling on all believers to remember his sacrificial death. Others call this communion to focus on our relationship with Christ. Others call it the Eucharist from the Greek word for thanksgiving to remind us to be thankful for Jesus' saving sacrifice. We call it the Lord's Supper. No matter what we call it, though, one thing is perfectly clear. It is a time to remember. It's important to note that the Lord's Supper is an ordinance and not a sacrament. The word sacrament comes from the Latin word sacramentum, and it describes an oath of loyalty that a Roman legionnaire would swear to his commanding officer. Now, in the sense that we're showing our allegiance to the Lord by observing the Lord's Supper, one might call this a sacrament. But over the years, this word has taken on an entirely different meaning. According to the Roman Catholic Church, a sacrament is something which, by its very nature, is a means by which God's grace is conveyed to us. 
In other words, by partaking of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, or to, by submitting to baptism, those, by those very acts, somehow our sins are forgiven. Now, as Baptists, we believe that grace comes through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that is a gift given by God, according to Ephesians chapter 2, 8, and 9. If that's the truth, that we believe that it is, then God's grace is not ours to control. It's not ours to give out. It's not ours to deny. It's an ordinance. And an ordinance is something that is commanded by the Lord, and he directs us to obey this. In its symbolic nature, it carries with it all the blessings that come with it when we are obedient to God's command. So there are blessings in baptism, and there are blessings in the Lord's Supper, but there are blessings that come to obedience or from obedience. We're not receiving any forgiveness of sins through what's called the sacraments. Now, before I give you some things to remember, I want to give you some of the historical significance. The Feast of the Unleavened Bread is the historical background for the establishment of the Lord's Supper. In Exodus chapter 12, it gives us the final chapter of God's miraculous deliverance of Israel from slavery in Egypt. In the course of moving Pharaoh to let his people go, God, you'll recall, sends a series of ten plagues, the last being the killing of every firstborn male child. Now, in order to avoid this plague, God instructed his people to kill a lamb and put its blood over the doorpost of their house and thus allowing the death angel to pass over that household, sparing the lives of the children in that household. And then they ate a Passover meal as instructed. Now, this meal of unleavened bread and the Passover lamb became the enduring symbols of Israel's deliverance from Egypt. When they celebrated the feast of the Passover, this is what they were remembering, the time when their children lived as the death angel passed over them. As Jesus' disciples watched Jesus and listened to his teaching about the Passover, they would have understood the historical significance of his actions. They were very familiar with all of this. What they didn't understand until after the resurrection was this now, that now this Jewish feast of remembrance had been transformed into a remembrance of Jesus and his saving sacrifice on the cross. Several years ago, my wife and I, along with Kevin and Lori, had the privilege of touring the battleship Missouri anchored off of Ford Island in Hawaii. We were coming home from a mission trip and we stopped off at Hawaii and we visited that historic place. And from what you might recall from your American history studies, the surrender of Japan took place on that very battleship. General Douglas MacArthur accepted the unconditional surrender of the Empire of Japan on September 7, 1945. This historic event ended the hostilities of World War II in the Pacific Theater. Uh, the signing of that treaty happened before most of us were born, maybe before all of us were born, but the events symbolized by that treaty shaped the world into which we were born and which we now live. An event that happened more than 70 years ago still has significance in your life and mine. We enjoy the freedoms secured by the heroic service of our parents and grandparents. The God who acted in history to deliver his people from Israel, uh, his people Israel also acted in history to deliver us. The elements used in the supper are not the real body or the real blood of Jesus, but they are powerful symbols that cause us to remember that Jesus really did die. He really did suffer on the cross in a really historic time and place. And what Jesus did centuries ago impacts my life today and yours as well.
Now, I want to point out that the Lord's Supper is significant regarding salvation. You'll recall in our study from John, when John the Baptist first saw Jesus approaching, you remember what he cried out? Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. John clearly established the reason for Jesus' coming as the fulfillment of what the Passover lamb had foreshadowed. In Exodus 12, the lamb was sacrificed for the deliverance of one family. At the cross, the lamb of God was sacrificed to deliver the whole world from the power and the penalty of sin. The Passover lamb served as the substitute of the firstborn of Israel, but Jesus was our substitute on Calvary. Without the death of the lamb and the spreading of his blood, the children of Israel would have suffered the judgment of God. Without the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ and his, substitutes, his substitutionary death, we would have no hope for salvation whatsoever. In his book, The Tale of the Tardy Oxcart, Charles Swindoll relates a story of an eight-year-old Kenyan girl, Monica, who fell into a pit and broke her leg. Mama and Jerry, an older woman, seeing what had happened, climbed in the pit to rescue Monica. In that pit, a black mamba, the most poisonous snake in Africa, bit both Monica and Mama Najiri. Both ladies were rushed to a medical center. Monica improved, but sadly, Mama Najiri died from the snake bite. A nurse missionary explained to Monica that Mama Najiri was bitten first, and thus she received the black mama's poison. When the snake bit Monica, it didn't have any poison left, and so she survived. And then the nurse went on to explain that Jesus had similarly taken the poison of sin so that we can live. And Monica understood and readily received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Many people have many different ideas about who Jesus is and why he came to earth. But Jesus said himself that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. When we gather around the Lord's table, the elements speak to us of his sacrifice, his substitution, and our salvation. We celebrate our redemption as we remember him. The Lord's Supper presents then a very powerful message in the gospel. That's why we show the Lord's death until he come, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But what a perfect time during the Lord's Supper, to give people an opportunity to receive the salvation purchased on the cross. It's a very evangelistic ceremony. Those who respond to that evangelistic message will remember that the symbols of the Lord's table spoke to them of their need and of Christ's provision for that need. They needed his blood. They needed his broken body in order to be saved. Now let's talk about the Lord's Supper's personal significance. We should remember the Supper's personal significance for each and every individual. Luke chapter 22, verses 19 through 20, records Jesus' words. And he took bread and gave thanks, and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise, also the cup, after the supper, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. See, Jesus personalized his statements by using that pronoun, you. Jesus told his disciples that he was going to suffer for them. He was going to die for them. His disciples heard Jesus saying, I'm doing this for you. And that's something we need to remember. Now, if you're like me, you receive more junk mail than any other kind of mail. And you know the kind of mail I'm talking about. It's addressed to occupant or resident. And if the envelope does have your name, it's usually computer-generated label. 
that may or not have your name spelled correctly. They're always misspelling my last name. In short, it's not personal. And most of us, we don't even open it. We just throw it in the garbage. If, however, you get a piece of mail with your name handwritten on it or even typed, or if you recognize the return address, then you know that someone has written to you personally. People generally open that kind of mail first, and it's always something that makes us happy. Personal mail shows that someone has taken time to think about you and to communicate with you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives us instructions concerning the Lord's Supper, and doing so reminds the Corinthians of two things. He reminds us and them of their personal salvation in Christ, and that participation in the supper carries both inward and outward aspects. Inwardly, participants are to examine themselves spiritually before taking the supper, as we read in verse 27 and 28. And outwardly, the participants through the supper uh, 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 show the Lord's death until he returns, as verse 26 says. So observing the Lord's supper carries personal significance because Jesus calls us to remember that he gave his body for you. It also carries personal responsibility for us to participate with reverence and humility and sincerity, understanding and proclaiming this great act of love on the, on the part of Christ. Paul says that our observance of the Lord's Supper is to be done be done to help us to remember Christ. Maybe we are never more the church, the bride of Christ, than when we gather at his table to worship by remembering him. And may we never forget. Now, with the significance in mind, let me take some time to help you with this remembering part. Tonight, we're all going to have some time to pray and think and remember. So what are you going to do with that time? What am I going to do with that time? One of the consequences of being a sinful and therefore flawed human being is forgetfulness. You don't have that problem, do you? No matter what our age, all of us have experienced what they sometimes call senior moments when memory fails us. I don't know about you, but mine seems to be failing more frequently as each year goes by. Simply remembering someone's name or a topic that I'm familiar with just escapes me. Sometimes I forget what I preached on last week. Someone will recall something in the sermon, and I don't even remember what I said in that sermon. It just happens to me. Think of it. How many times... Have you met someone that you haven't seen in a long time and you knew them very, very well, but your mind freezes up and you, you just can't remember their name? Does that ever happen? Maybe you go to a family reunion or a class reunion, and, and how many times did you have to kind of look down at the name tag, you know, hello, my name is so-and-so, in order to remember their name? And we feel embarrassed about the things that we forget, not remembering a name. Husbands, have you ever ended up in the doghouse because you forgot your wife's birthday or the anniversary of your marriage? Wives, have you caused your husband frustration because you forgot your cell phone at the restaurant 90 miles back and now we have to turn around and get it? Have you ever done something like that? Students, have you ever forgotten a homework assignment or you've forgotten an answer to a test question in spite of the fact that you sure, you were so sure that you knew the material, but you just drew a blank? How many of us have just felt the, the, the electrical shock when you remember something important that you've forgotten? Oh, I was supposed to be there at such and such a time. Oh, I had to make a phone call and I forgot it. We've all been there. The truth is, folks, if we're honest, we all struggle with forgetfulness. One of the places that our flawed memories can cause the most damage is in our Christian walk. 
And maybe this is why God spends so much time encourages, encouraging his people to remember him and remember his words. I've noticed a lot of people, they start to begin to read the Bible through, through at the beginning of the new year, and there's nothing wrong with that practice. If you do that over and over and over again in the Old Testament, God says to the people of Israel, remember Remember that you were a slave in Egypt. Remember the way that I, the Lord your God, have led you. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember and obey my Sabbath commandment. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. On and on and on it goes. Now one thing that helps us remember is what you might call a memory tool. And you know what I'm talking about. Sometimes I want to remember someone's name and so I try to do a word association with that name. I'm still bad at it. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not good with names, but I'm good with faces. I'm not good with names. I'm not good with faces. And that doesn't serve me very well as a pastor, especially if we have a second time visitor and I didn't know they came the first time. More often than not, if I want to remember to do something, I'll take my ring on this finger and I'll put it on the other finger. And that always reminds me to do what I wanted to remember to do. Pictures help us to remember events or things that we saw on vacations. That's why we take pictures. On my wall, wall in, in my office, I have several pieces of memorabilia that reminds me of the wonderful missionary trips that I've been able to take. There are two pictures that I took, one on the way and one of the Isle of Skye in Scotland. I just have to gaze at those pictures and I'm reminded of that beautiful day that we drove all around the Isle of Skye. I can almost smell the sheep from all the sheep farms that were there. All those memories I consider a personal present from God himself. Now in the 15th chapter of Numbers, God gave the people of Israel a memory tool. God had made a covenant with them. And on his side of the covenant, God promised continued protection. On their side, they were to obey God's loving commands, his tender commandments. Well, God knew their weaknesses when it came to memory. And so he ordered Moses to have the people make themselves a memory jogging tool. Take your Bibles out, if you would, and let's read about it together. Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 41. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen behind me. Numbers 15, 37 through 41. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them, and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord your God. So you see, in this text, God told them to put tassels on their robes and to tie a cord around each one of them to remember their part of the covenant. You need to remember this. You need to remember this. This was done in much of the same way that, that someone would tie a string around their finger to help us remember something important. Or as I mentioned earlier, taking my ring from one hand to the other to remember something. Well, when God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, was about to leave his first disciples, he knew that they too would soon forget his offer of grace and his call to discipleship. And so he gave them a memory tool as well. I'm referring to the Lord's Supper, because like the tassels on the robes of the Hebrews, the bread and the cup are to remind us of this vital truth. First of all, the bread and cup remind us of Christ's sacrifice. 
You see, that night, as they shared their last supper, they did so in the shadow of the cross. The disciples didn't realize this, but Jesus did. Our Lord was keenly aware of what was ahead of him on that night. Remember, he said of himself in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And so one thing these elements are supposed to remind us of is the fact that by dying on Calvary's cross, Jesus paid for our sins. He sacrificed his own life for each of us. He substituted his life for yours and for mine. Now, I know you're familiar with that, but we need to remember that. And apparently, we tend to forget that. The English author John Stott wrote this. Listen to what he said. The concept of substitution lies at the heart of both sin and salvation. For the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Isn't that brilliant? I wish I was smart like that to make such comments like that. It's so true. We tend to substitute ourselves for God instead of remembering them substituting himself for us. The bread and the cup are to remind us that when he hung on Calvary's cross, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, was dying in our place. Several years ago, on October 2nd, 2006, it was a dark day for the Amish community in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. You might recall that morning, if you're old enough, a local milkman named Charles Carl Roberts barricaded himself inside the West Nickel Mine Amish school. He was armed with three guns, knives, and over 600 rounds of ammunition. And when the police attempted to intervene less than a half an hour later, Roberts opened fire on 11 girls, all less than 14 years of old, and he killed five of them. After these brutal acts, he turned his weapon on himself and he committed suicide. It was a very dark and violence-filled hour in the life of that peaceful Amish community. But as more news became available in the days that followed, a new story began to emerge full of courage and faith and love. According to two witnesses, two survivors, when 13-year-old Marie Fisher began to understand what this murderer intended to do, she made a request. Shoot me first, she said, and leave the other ones loose. As the oldest child in the group, she hoped that her death might somehow spare the other children or at least buy some time so that they might be rescued. And immediately after this request, Marie's younger sister, Barbie, said, shoot me second. Now, I don't know all this for a fact because I wasn't there, but I do believe that many people who knew the girls believed this was a true story as well. I believe that these young Amish girls, and all I don't agree with all Amish theology, I believe that they understood about Jesus dying for them on the cross. And it inspired them to set an example for the other girls as they were willing to risk their lives and give their lives for the others. They, had, they knew and they remembered what Jesus did. He died so we could live, and this memory motivated them to give their lives for their friends. One of the purposes of the Lord's Supper is to help us to never forget this astounding fact. This bread and this cup are not meant to feed us, but to remind us of Christ and his sacrifice on our behalf. Because in a way that we can never fully understand this side of eternity, on Calvary's cross, Jesus died in our place. His sacrifice paid for our sin. He died so that we could live. Now, I know that you know this. We taught this for 38 years. But the Lord wants us to be constantly reminded of this amazing fact and then never take it for granted but always remember. 
And next, the Lord's Supper is also a reminder of the love that Jesus' sacrifice revealed. In the 15th chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus said, Greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Well, that's what Jesus did for us on the cross. As someone else put it, it was not the nails that held him to the cross, it was his love for you and me. During the Christmas season, one of the popular movies is Frank Capra's It's a Wonderful Life. Most of you have seen the movie, and you might remember that the main character of the movie, George Bailey, saved his little brother Harry's life. Picture the scene. They were boys. They were sledding down a hill on a cold winter day using coal shovels instead of sleds, and Harry slid farther than the rest of the boys, but he slid so far that he landed on thin ice on a lake, and he fell through into the freezing water. He was sure to drown, but big brother George Bailey didn't hesitate. He jumped in and he saved Harry, but in so doing, the icy cold waters damaged hearing in one of his ears. And for the rest of his life, the scar tissue made him deaf on one side. But that scar tissue was much more than a hearing handicap. All his life, it was a constant reminder to Harry of how much his big brother loved him, enough to risk his own life to save him. Well, as Christians, we are God's children because we have been spiritually adopted into his family. Paul refers to Jesus as our big brother who showed his love for us by coming to our rescue on Calvary's cross. Much like George Bailey's scars, Jesus' scars are visible reminders of Jesus' great love for you and for me. And the Lord's Supper points us to the cross, and all we need to do is to look at the cross to see how much Jesus loves us, how much God loves us. And if we want to get theological, he loved us before the foundations of the world. The third thing I'd like you to remember tonight is that the Lord's Supper helps us never to forget Jesus' future return. In 1 Corinthians 11, the Apostle Paul wrote concerning the Lord's Supper, and he said, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. You see, we observe the Lord's Supper in the midst of history, but we do so with the eye toward the end of history and our Lord's triumphant return. This is our great hope as Christians, that Christ, who was born in Bethlehem, crucified on Calvary, and raised on that first Easter morning, he's coming again. You recall in our study of Revelation in the previous years, mostly what we get out of that is, in the end, Christ wins. <laughs> he's coming back, and he's winning. The risen Christ, with whom we have fellowship here at the table tonight, is going to return to earth someday. He's going to return visibly, and he's going to return victoriously. And this is something we must never forget, for it's a promise that gives us bright hope, even in the darkest hours of life here on earth. We know that a day is going to dawn when we won't just taste the joy we experience when we get together with old friends or family during the holidays. No, when Jesus comes back, he'll take us home. We will all be together again with parents and grandparents and spouses and children and dear friends, never to be parted again. And more important than that, we will see our Savior face to face. A few years ago, I read about a church building in Poland that had been reduced to rubble during World War II. After the war, the congregation was too poor to buy materials to rebuild the church building, and so they broke the rubble into smaller pieces, mixed in concrete, and they rebuilt the church with those recycled materials from the first building. And when it was complete, they wrote the following words above the door, lift up your hearts. Well, the Lord's Supper is also a heart-lifting experience, or it should be tonight. It's a time to lift up our hearts to be glad of the sure promise of Christ's return. Do you remember when Jesus first 
disciples stood looking upward after having watched his ascending angels come to them. And they said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. That's God's promise. So the Lord's Supper reminds us as forgetful human beings of Jesus' sacrifice, of his great love, and his promised return. Those are three things you can think about tonight, among other things, as the Spirit leads you. I hope that this might help you when we gather tonight to give you some time alone with the Lord before we distribute the elements of the Lord's Supper. I want us all to jar our memories even further so that we can recall all we can about our Lord's coming to the earth. I want us to use all the tools we have at our disposal. Keep in mind, though, above all, the Lord's Supper is remembering. This message of reminders may have prompted you to respond. Maybe as a Christian, you feel the need to simply say, help me remember, God. Help me never forget all that you've done for me. Keep me near the cross so that I can live for you in light of that. If you're not a believer, maybe the Holy Spirit will take something said in this message to trigger your mind and soul that you need such a Savior as Jesus Christ. All this talk about his sacrifice on the cross may lead you to believe that Jesus had died for you as a sinner. And if this, this is true work of the Spirit of God, he will lead you to repent and believe the gospel, the good news that Jesus Christ is the Savior of sinners just like you. And you can have him as your Savior simply by repenting and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved for all eternity. We pray that God will be working in all hearts who hear this message and work in his sovereign will in, his every, in every life for his own glory. May the preaching of the word of God be used mightily for the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, I do pray that you'll take this simple message regarding the Lord's Supper that you instituted some 2,000 years ago and make it a joyful celebration as we remember you, as we remember your death in our place, as we remember your resurrection, your second coming, your love for us, all these things that we've talked about call to our memory. And may we, by remembering you, glorify you. We know that it pleases you for us to have thoughts about you and all that you are and all that you've done. And we've had those thoughts this morning. And we ask that you have been glorified now through the preaching of the word. Now we ask that you would bless it for your glory and your honor and for the betterment of saint and sinner alike, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.